we have a, uh, an interactive sermon. I'll warn you ahead of time. I'll ask you to do a few things, and uh, I pray that we are all permanently blessed, not temporarily blessed. Amen? This is Religious Liberty Sabbath. Let me get my clicker out. There we go. This is Religious Liberty Sabbath. And with that, I want to just give a little plug-in before we started preaching hard. Because this is a very important mission. This movement has advocated religious freedom for over 120 years. It's done it through the SDA Department of Public Affairs and Religious Liberty. This is started by us. This is our movement. The offices are in Washington, D.C., providing efficient access to the U.S. Congress, New York City, communicating with the United Nations as a liaison, and the headquarters for Religious Liberty Department is found in Silver Springs, Maryland, which also sponsors the International Religious Liberty Association, or the IRLA. This brings so many representatives from so many different religions, including Catholic, Baptist, Muslim, Jews, Mormons, Buddhist, and many others. I do not need to explain further that the Seventh-day Adventist Church strongly believes in religious freedom for all people, all tongues, all tribes, and all nations. This advocation from our movement directly affected me. At one point in time in my life, I wanted to read my Bible at work. I was attempted to be stopped. This movement gave me the freedom to read my Bible at work. I needed Sabbath off. I was convicted of a special day to come to worship. And this movement assisted me through my workplace to getting off the day of worship that I was convicted of. It allowed me to do Bible studies in freedom. Your tithes, your loose offerings went towards this today. It's an amazing mission of great importance because essentially it's a person's conscience, not government, that should determine or dictate his or her choice to worship or even not to worship if that's the case. It is described in our Declaration of Independence and it's inscribed within our movement. And it's with this freedom that I bring you this message today of salvation. It's with this movement that I come to you with the Word of God. And this message today is a message of salvation. It's a message to give you a pathway to the throne of grace. A road to recovery from the sickness, the illness, the old life we used to live to a new life that God has planned for you. It is a way to get past the, the midnight of your life that you've been stuck in and bring you to the dawn of a new day. Amen? This message should not last only to this evening's end when Sabbath is over, but it should get us through the whole year. This is a three-series message. It's called Crossing a Breach. Today's message is going to be called leaving the coast, and we're talking about when Jesus beckons, follow me, follow after me. Next week's message is going to be called Through the Storm. Being a Christian is not always easy, is it? We're going to talk about getting through that storm. It might be a little bumpy, but uh, this hopefully next week's message will help through that. The final message of the three is going to be called on the other side. And it's talking about what we should do when we get to the other side and what we should not do. <clears throat> Through these three messages, I hope that we can, in our new year, make a new choice for a God to give us a new life, a recommitment. Amen? So before we begin, let's start off this journey with a prayer to consecrate the, word, the reading of God's Word. Lord our Father, I dare not read the words of this 
holy book, this perfect book, without first asking for you to bless it. Anoint my lips, anoint my mind, anoint my eyes, anoint my ears. Lord, allow me to speak your words and your words only. Allow the hearts of those who are listening here and those who are online to receive your word deep within their hearts, allowing a change, Lord, a transformation to occur from a, a life full of pain, misery, suffering, and sorrow to a new life full of joy, happiness, and righteousness. Lord, in all ways, may we glorify you. And so we ask this in your name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen, amen. Does anybody know what xenophobia is? Xenophobia. It is the fear or hatred of strangers or foreigners, or also known as the fear of anything that's strange or foreign. It literally, it means the fear of the unknown. And what I'm going to be asking of you guys today is to go to an unknown location. I'm going to ask that um, you have faith. Faith is to have trust. Now, I'm not asking for a blind faith. I'm not asking for you to close your eyes and follow me, but I'm going to ask that you keep your eyes open as I present evidences for these next few weeks and to make an educated decision with your own mind that we can make a choice in our life that will make it better. The unknown location is a place that God has planned for us. And even I do not know where I will be in five years or in five days. God knows. And if I lean upon his understanding, if I lean upon his will, if I lean upon his goodness, wherever that might be is a better place than I would end up if I used my own guidance. Amen? So we're going to go to what's called the unknown. Now the faith I'm going to ask you to have is a strong faith and not a weak faith. Let me, let me interpret this. A weak faith is knowing that if his plan fails in my eyes, then I can recuperate back to where I was without no problem whatsoever. If I was to have faith that God was behind me and I start falling backwards, I wouldn't just lean this far. I would let my heels go, knowing that God would have me and have my back. There's a point when gravity is going to take over. That's the point when you have faith. Past the point when gravity takes over and you can no longer rely upon your own strength, your own balance, or anything of you. True faith is placing your life in God's hand. It's knowing the cost of discipleship because it comes at a cost. It's not free. It needs to be a decision of faith that's beyond our instinctive doubt. And lastly, the time to choose this faith is not tomorrow. It's not next week or next month. It has to be right now and today. We might have issues with that. And it's okay to have issues with that. It's okay to say, well, I got to pray about this. Well, I have a matter to attend to. I need to do some things first before I commit myself so heavenly to such a cause. In the back, inside the sanctuary, on a table, there's a box. That box was put there. It's exactly the right size to fit one of these blue cards into it. These blue cards are in front of you. Some of you want to see a pastor. Some of you want to be visited. And I'm doing my best. I know Pastor Harley's doing his best. I know Pastor Joe Ray's doing his best. I won't get Pastor Dino out there and we're going to do our best together. Amen? I do visit a lot of you, but usually I visit a lot of you in the worst of situations. But I want to visit some of you when there is no situation or when you have a question for the pastor 
or it is when you, you need to unload, but you want to do it in the privacy of your own home. I want you to fill this out today. And on your way out, I want you to drop it into the box. And after this sermon, I'm going to go to the back with that box. I want to find a way to visit each one of the people, or Pastor Harley or Pastor Joe Ray will come together and we'll visit you soon and very soon. And we'll call you with the time and date. But I need you to fill this out for me, please. Don't let this opportunity pass. We want to come see you. We just need to know that you need to see us. Amen? If you don't want to fill that blue card out, you have a bulletin. On the bottom of this bulletin, there is a number for the office. Call up our secretary. Let her know you want to be visited. I'll be on my desk next few minutes, or our Pastor Harley's desk next few minutes, and we'll still come see you. Amen? All right. We want to help you with your struggle if you're having struggles in faith. You can't go to the next step until you are able to have faith. And that's, I really feel that's my job description is to promote you to have faith. To let you know that there's a God out there. It's not some mythical being. It's not some invisible man behind a curtain. He's a real person. And he came to this world. But we need to have faith in that man named Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God the Father. And he has given each one of us the Holy Spirit to convict us of righteousness, of sin, and of the time of the end. I will do my level best to work with you. Just let me know you're struggling. There are a few people we know that had to face faith. Let's see if I get this thing to really work. It is on. Okay, we had Abraham, right? What did Abraham do? He left the land he was accustomed to, and he went to an unknown land. He followed God's guidance to the land of Ur from the Chaldeans to what would one day be the uh, valley near the what we call the Salt Sea or the Dead Sea today. After that, we had Noah. Noah built a house, on, or built, a, built a boat on dry ground. I want you to think about that. Built a boat on dry ground. A boat so big it could be used in no small body of fresh water at that time. He built a huge boat, expecting to be, for it to be used. He even hopped in it, and then for seven days, there was not a drop from the sky. The same old dude came out the ground, and everybody outside thought he was crazy. Did he come out of that boat? He had faith. Levitical priests. Does anybody know what this is? This is a shofar. I got this from Israel. It's a beautiful shofar. I'm going to play it in a second. This shofar was the only weapon a Levitical priest had. They were facing Jericho, who was a fortress. Inside it had swords, shields, knives, and all kinds of bows and arrows. But the Levitical priest had no knife, had no sword. But they marched around Jericho. And on the seventh day, they marched seven times. What did they do? They blew their horn, right? I don't want to blow it loud because I don't want to hurt nobody's ears. By the way, that's B flat. <laughs> For Miss Carla Simmons, who did an awesome special music. They blew their horn, and the walls came tumbling down. They were armed with nothing with horns, just a horn. That's faith. If they blew their horns only made sounds, the men could have came running out the walls and just butchered them. But they had faith. That's the kind of faith, biblical faith, I need you to have today. Amen? 
We consistently need direction in our lives. Divine guidance is what I'm going to call it, from above. Now, the direction will look different from each person here. It's going to be a different kind. It might be bumpy along the way, but that's a good reason for you to cling upon the robe of Christ. I'm not saying it's going to be easy. I'm not saying it's going to be fast. But I will tell you that the ending destination is well worth the travel. It's well worth the tribulation. It's well worth the effort. There's another group of people that I want to talk about. There's another group of people that were facing what you would call going to the unknown. They had every reason to be afraid. They had every reason to be scared. They had every reason to doubt. And I am sure that their feelings of uncertainty are exponentially greater than anybody's in this room right now. But they made a decision to go. They made a decision to go to the unknown and not turn back. One report from these individuals was this. He says, the main engines ignited six seconds before liftoff. The entire orbiter rattled and shuddered like a skyscraper in an earthquake. A deep rumble shook the cabin as the main engines came up to full thrust. The pounding exhaust from the twin boosters shook us continually as we accelerated with spine-tingling screams of the slipstream, wailing outside of the cabin. It was the immense power unleashed in barely controlled fury. They were sitting on thousands of pounds of fuel. And one guy in the bottom says, I'm going to light a match. And you'll be okay. They had faith. They went to the unknown. The world was behind them. And the heavens were before them. As they, as they crossed out of the grasping orbit of Earth, past our gravity, they felt their bodies lose weight when they enter space. The screaming engines, the vibrations ceased. There was a pause, a moment of silence. Do you know what they did? They breathed. They made it. It worked. We're going to try a a quick exercise. You ready? You have faith? Okay. I want everybody in the room and everybody who's watching online, take a deep breath. Let it out. I need you to take a second breath a little bit deeper this time. Hold it. Now let it out. Last time, I promise. Make this one count. Take the deepest breath you can take and hold it. That was the last breath of your old life. If you want to make that decision today, that was the last moment of the old person. I want you to go ahead and if you have a little place on your bulletin, on a notepad at home, I want you to write the time and the date of that moment. We're going to come back to this. This is the last moment of your old life. Today we're going to start a voyage from the coast of the old life to the shore of the new life. A place that God has planned and prepared you for. Today Jesus Jesus is making a call that he wants you to answer. I know it's unusual, but I'm going to pray one more time because this is a very important message, okay? 
eyes closed, head bowed. Lord, as we begin a journey that you have called us upon, this may be the fifth, tenth, twelfth time that you've called us to make a new choice. But Lord, for many out there, this is the first time that you have called out to them so publicly. Lord, as we sacrifice whatever the world has to offer, may we gain what you have prepared. As we leave back the old life that we have tried to piece together ourselves, may we lean upon the new life that you have masterpieced for us. As we try to be an architect and build a house, may we know that you can build skyscrapers and mansions. Lord, allow us to no longer lean upon our own understanding, but to listen to the words that you have for us. We ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. During the days, I want you to pay close attention. During the days when Israel was captive by, Israel, by Egypt, there was a man sent to them. His name was Moses. As you may remember, Moses was raised by Egyptians. In fact, he was Egyptian royalty. He was in the Pharaoh's house. He was a ruler of the land. Is that correct? That's why when he says, I'm slow of tongue, it's because he spoke a different language, by the way. But he came back to Egypt with nothing more than a stick and a word. He says, let my people go. Talking to the oppression of the Egyptians. Through the guidance of God, a Hebrew who was raised Egyptian, led God's people out of captivity. Does anybody remember where he was going? He was going to the promised land. They were going towards the Red Sea, right? I want you to understand something. And I'm sure the Israelites and the Egyptians that were joining the Israelites had a question too. Did they build a new bridge that crossed the Red Sea? Were we going to build our homes, our new Israel homes, are they going to be built on the side of the Egyptian coast? You see, Moses knew there was a dead end ahead of him. He knew in front was the Red Sea. Yet by God's guidance, he says, follow me. Trust me. He was leading him to what we would call a dead end in our finite human minds. God says, I need you to go this direction and keep going and don't stop. Can you see the faith in this? I'm, I'm, I'm really asking, can you see the faith? You might not have perceived it before, but Moses, after 40 years of being talked to by God, led the children of Israel to a dead end. Moses knew it was a dead end. He was royalty. When you're royal, you walk your land. It's a normal thing for royal people to do. Yet he's walking them dead straight into the Dead Sea. Is he expecting they're going to swim across? I don't think so. I don't think so. Today, God is crying out to you. He says, I know it seems as if you have a dead end in your life. You have no answer for the problems you're about to face. It seems we're going forward only to be stopped. He says, follow me. He knows you might not have the answers to life's problems. He's okay with that. 
He says, follow me. Oh. We say the world is against us. He says, good. The Egyptian army was coming behind them. He says, follow me. Trust me. Beyond your finite capability, beyond the ability to recover, I want you to have faith. The scripture verse for today I found to be very suiting. 1 John chapter 2, verse 17, and it says, And the world is, it's not possible, it is right now, passing away, and the lust of it will follow. But he who does the will of God dwells, abides, and lives with God forever. God before us, the world behind us. Unfortunately, time after time after time after time again, the children of Israel and ourselves, we get lost. Myself, I can't count the amount of times. I'm embarrassed to say I've been lost even after I got baptized, but I have been lost after I got baptized. I've been lost after, after my, my, my last foot washing. We're going to fall. We're going to bump our heads. We're going, we're going to get misguided sometimes. This morning's Bible study for the youth was about Solomon, the wisest man in the entire world. He stopped leaning upon God's understanding, and he fell. He fell hard. Wisest man ever will be fell without God. What chance do we have? We need to be relying upon his divine guidance in all aspects of our life. If we do not and we get hurt, there's a reason why. While I'm, uh, while I'm preparing to take the context, go ahead and your Bibles turn to Luke chapter 9. You see, the issue of the human heart is we get confounded, distracted, and disrupted. We're trying to use man's traditions in order to find a way to heaven instead of relying upon God's instructions. And he's the one who created heaven. Do you understand the, do you understand the fallacy of trying to lean upon man? We're trying to find a place that we've never been before. We don't know how to get there, but yet we feel we can give guidance outside of this Bible. This Bible is the only source of the Word of God that we have that we can depend upon. The words in it are true and sure. Amen? Luke chapter 9. Mercy, mercy, mercy. And uh, before, before we go into the story, it's going to be 9, and we'll be going to the latter end, about 57 through 62. The preface to this, um, there was two of the disciples. It was John and one of his comrades, James, that were going through to go and knock on a Samaritan door to see if they go through a Samaritan village. The Samaritan said, no, thank you. So they reported back to Jesus, and they said, shall we burn the place to the ground? Jesus says, I did not come to destroy, but to save. Right? That's, that's Christ's character right there. Even to his enemies, I came not to destroy, I came to save. In Matthew chapter 8, 20, you see where Jesus is arriving in Capernaum, Peter's village. And every person in that village was healed of infirmities. Demons were cast out. Peter's mother was cured of her fever. Samaria, 
that Samaritan village lost an appointment with Christ. One village declined and another village was blessed. Oh, Samaria, if you would just accept a Savior. He leaves Peter's village, and now we're going to pick it up in our story. Now it happened in verse 57, as they journeyed on the road, that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you where? Wherever you go, I'll follow you. Isn't that so easy to say? I'll follow you, Lord. Now, normally if I was, I would think if I'm a leader, and somebody said, somebody said that to me, I'm like, oh, come on. But Jesus here does something radical. He says, foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, right? Let me get to my first slide. But the Son of Man has nowhere to go. What was he saying? What was he just saying to this one man who was like, I will follow you to the ends of the earth. He was looking in the man's heart. He saw that this man had to count the cost of discipleship quite yet. Okay. So paraphrasing, he says, I want you to count the cost. Even the wild animals have a place to stay. Even the foxes, which no man can tame, and the birds of the air, which no man has caged, they have homes. But you, if you follow me, will have no place sometimes to lay your head. Do not count on the comforts of the world if you choose to follow me. That's not a luxury you may get. Don't expect anything from the world. Don't expect anything out of it. No payment. So the question is for us today, do we follow Jesus for our prize? No, Pastor. No way. Let me clarify. Do we follow Jesus because he offers eternal life? Do we, off, do we, do we follow Jesus because he has prepared a place for us? Is it the item of why we follow Jesus? Or is it because we love him for who he is and what he has done in our lives? You see, if you want Jesus to woo you, all you got to do is ask. He's already knocking upon the door of your heart. If you let him in, he'll show you and give you ample reasons why he loves you. But it should not be for eternal life that we follow Christ. It should not be for the, the, the robe he will give us one day. It should not be for the feast at that wedding table. Instead, let me ask you another question. Now, some people are too young here for this illustration, but I'll try to make it all-encompassing. Husbands, do you love your wife because of the material items she has? Wives, do you love your husband for his hairline? Because that will go away. <laughs> his physique, that's fading quickly. Do we have boyfriends and girlfriends because they're cool in school? One day school is going to end and they'll no longer be cool. Do we love them because they have the newest iPhone? One's coming out next week. <laughs> the items we have the things of this world we cannot depend upon, lean upon, or have any interest in. We love our husbands and our wives because they have won our heart. Today, Jesus Christ desires to win your heart. Will you let him? Will you let him? Then he said to another, follow me. I want to go through this real fast because I love this. I was looking through the Hebrew Bible to find this. Now, it's so awkward not moving away from the pulpit. 
when Jesus says, follow me, we're reading it in English. Does anybody know what language the New Testament was actually written in? Greek. So when we go to the Greek, it is akolothia. Okay? But did Jesus speak Greek? No. He spoke Hebrew. And in Hebrew, it's achar, which means follow me. Come before me and after me at the same time. We'll cover this in a few minutes, but this is a beautiful word, achar. If you know any Hebrew word, this is the word to know. Amen? But the man said, But Lord, let me first go and bury my father. That's not a bad request. Let me bury my father, and then I'll follow you. Okay. I had to wrestle with this a little bit. Because he just said to him, let the dead bury what? I've tried to say this with the most compassionate heart, and it still sounds rude. Let the dead bury their dead. Hey, don't worry. Let the dead bury their dead. No, no, it doesn't work out for me. So I had to stop here for about two weeks and research this. There's two main lines of thought. One is that there's a dead person behind the man, and he's waiting to bury him. Now, that's only about 10% of theologians that believe in that facet. And I don't believe in it one bit. The second one says... Um, that his father is on hospice. His father's dying. His father's frail and on, uh, just, just, just about to die, so he's the caregiver. That's majority of the um, thought process. Most theologians believe that. I need to disagree with them because the Bible itself says um, in 1 Timothy 5.8, if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. I really try to search and find out where the character of Christ can be found in let the dead bury their dead. Hmm. I did researching in the Gospels. I found another time when he gave an illustration. The young prodigal son. Every son is granted an inheritance. Jesus, wait just a little while longer. I'm going to bury my father any day now. And after we sell the matter, after that, I will be more than happy to follow you. Just let me get what is entitled to me. But Jesus is asking, whose inheritance do you want? Do you want the inheritance of the world, which will be spent and will pass away? Or do you want the inheritance that I have for you? See, I, I believe the Father is in not bad health. I believe he's just waiting for his father to one day maybe have an accident, die, or whatever can happen so he can get that inheritance. I don't feel there's any other reason why Jesus would say, let the dead bury their dead. And even that, I want you to understand, he says, let the spiritually dead person bury those who are also spiritually dead. Because all my disciples who believe in me are standing before me. All my disciples who have made a choice to follow me are here. Those who have made a choice to stay behind are behind. Do you understand? So even though it seemed really rough and really rude, maybe this pastor got it wrong. But that's my opinion on what it might stand for. Jesus beckoned again at this young man, and he beckons at you today. Follow me. Leave the cares of this world. Leave the inheritances of this world. Leave the possessions of this world behind. Now, I'm not saying go sell everything you have today. 
Don't give it to goodwill this afternoon. But make a choice that your possessions don't own you, that you own your possessions. And another, verse 61. And another also said, Lord, I will follow you. But first, let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. Not such a bad request. I mean, what, what's, it takes about a week party, by the way. It lasts a few days. And Jesus knows if you return back. He knows if you get just one more taste of your past. If you go back one more time to your favorite spots. If you do your delicacies or your sins one more time. This opportunity can very well be your last. And you won't be able to follow him later. One more time to break the rules before we have to keep them. Mercy. That's not the kind of faith that Jesus Christ wants. Verse 62 states in a good little parable, But Jesus said to him, No one, having put in his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of heaven or God. Do you understand? Has anybody drove here? And then they look to the left. And when they get back their eyes on the road, they're veered off to the left. Or when they look to the right, they get back and they are veered to the right. Water was a, a treasure in a desert of Jerusalem. Only one river, very small, provided water. And only one season was there water present for that, for that whole country. If you made those little lines for irrigation in the wrong direction, half of your crops would die. If you are trying to be on a fence and be an example Christian, many people will not find salvation because they will follow your guidance. Let me, let me, many people who follow a Christian who is on a fence will not find salvation because your guidance will lead them to the world. That's okay to indulge in the world and be a Christian at the same time. Jesus is not looking for a part-time Christian. Let me be very clear then. How about this? You go to an auto mechanic because you have bald tires or your brakes are failing. I don't care which one you choose. You watch the mechanic work on your car. He fixes only the left-hand side, but he charges you for the whole amount. Will you be okay paying that bill? Will you be okay driving that car? I would not be. Jesus says, I don't need you halfway in. I need you all in. Does that make sense? Praise God. In Isaiah chapter 43, verse 18, do I have it here? I hope I do. Nope, I don't. Let me go back. In Isaiah 43, verse 18, and I believe it's on your bulletin too, oh. the Word of God says, Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Now, I want to try a live illustration here, and I need an assistant. Nobody's been pre-vetted for this. I want somebody who raises their hand. Praise God. And I like young men and women who are willing to, uh, to volunteer themselves. Oh, I got this. I got this. I can walk again. Come up. I am going to be on stage because they like me on stage, so come up here for me real fast. Remember I told you about that illustration that says, Ahar, it says follow me, before and after? We're going to watch this illustration in live, all right? Now, what is your name, sir? Before me is Ethan, and Ethan is going to be playing the role of Ethan. I will, though, be playing the role of Jesus and I don't deserve to play that role, but for this illustration item, I will. I want to tell Ethan to put your hands on my hands. There we go. 
and I'm going to say, follow me. Now, if you're going to take the first step, follow me, take the first step. Okay, now, if this is the case, he's trying to lead Jesus, right? And this is the issue in most of our lives. We try to lead Jesus around. Now, I'm going to walk forward. Okay, you ready? You trust me? Okay, I'm not going to lead you anywhere bad. Follow me. Now, I want you to pay attention. Where was Ethan a moment ago? Keep going. Follow me. He was behind me, yeah? Okay. I'm going to ask you a question. I need you to answer. You ready? You're following Jesus right now, right? What do you see if I'm playing Jesus? What two things can you see? Hope. Okay, hope, but you see, Jesus. and I am playing, I'm playing Jesus. And now if you look behind me, you were standing right there. What else can you see? <coughs> Where you were standing, right? That's his past. So Ethan, you can see your past, and you can see Jesus. Now, I'm Jesus. What two things do I see? I see Ethan. What else can I see if I look past you? My past. No, no, no. Your past is back there. I want to take the next step. I'm making sure you're going to be safe. Oh, let's go this way. What else do I see? I see where you're going to go. I see your future. What am I not concerned about? Where I'm going. No, where you were. I am concerned where you're going. I want to make sure you're safe. All right? Essentially, when I say, Ahar, follow me, I am seeing Ethan, and I'm seeing his future. I am not worried about anything back there. I'm not going to look back. I am looking to guide him to my home, which is in heaven. I'm trying to guide you to salvation. The only thing you can see is me and your past. Guess what you cannot see? My future. Amen. He can't see his future. Thank you very much, Ethan. Can you see? Can you see when Jesus says, follow me, what he means? He means don't worry. Don't focus on your past so much. I know you can see it. Focus on me. Don't worry about your future. You can't see it. You don't know if you're going to wake up tomorrow. I got that. I'll guide you. Trust me, if I came to earth to die for you, do you think I care about you? I will. I will guide you. I'll take care of you. You will not fall. You will not stumble. Just hold on to my hands, and I will be there for you. Your past. I don't care about your past. Why am I worried about your past? I'm worried about your I'm worried about your future. Today, follow me. Give me both your hands. One won't do. Any man putting his hand to the plow and looking back is not fit. Now, not many of you filled out that form when you took your last breath. And you might take many last breaths. But Jesus is serious. We're not going to be able, when we see the clouds break open before us and God present himself to us, at that point in time, it is already too late. And that's a sign in the heavens. If I leave here today and I'm away outside this parking lot, a semi-truck rolls over my car and destroys my body. Today was my last day. And I cannot make a decision for tomorrow. If I have an aneurysm, which cannot be detected by any test, and I should go to the doctor constantly, takes my life and puts me to sleep, 
today was my last day. If for some reason my, my stomach stops, stops accepting nutrition, I will starve to death in a matter of moments. And that was my last day. How many more chances do you want before you are willing to accept Jesus? I want to open up the scriptures with a parallel real fast, if you don't mind. And this is very important. Same story. We're still in Mark. Oh, sorry. Let's hop, let's hop, let's hop, let's hop over to Mark chapter 6, verse 45. We're not still there. We're in Luke 9. So we're going to go to Mark chapter 6, verse 45. So we have who he said, follow me, and those who asked to follow him. He has his disciples gathered before him. He just got done healing in, in uh, Capernaum. He just got done leaving the Samaritan village. And it says, immediately he made who? He made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. He sent them away. He took them in a boat. He said, I have prepared a path. I have prepared a place for you. Get in this boat and let's begin our journey, right? Don't let this second part be read too fast. What did he do with everybody else? Did you get it? Many are called. Many of those people that he sent away were healed. They had demons cast out of them. They heard the same word everybody else heard. But they did not decide to follow Jesus. And he sent the multitude away. I don't want that to happen to us, church. Heaven won't be heaven without all of you there. I'm not sure how many more wake-ups you have. I'm not sure how many days, months, years we have. But I'm not a betting man when it comes to eternal life, eternal salvation, a life without pain and suffering, which are all the benefits of my relationship I have established with the one who cares more about me than I can never care about him. I love him, but he loves me more. If I'm willing to stand before you today and give you this message, how much does he love you? He calls to you day in and day out. Will we answer today? So here is grace and mercy. You have that same slip in front of you. Are you willing to make the choice today and saying this is the last minute, hour, day, month, and year of my old life and the start of my new life? Let's pray. Lord, our Father, this is the first of three messages you have for us. You are beckoning, follow me. Whatever it takes, I'll take care of, but follow me. Don't hold on to the world no longer. It's not safe. It's not guaranteed how much longer it will last. It's not guaranteed if it's going to try to devour you. But through me, you'll find safety and security. Through me, you'll find happiness and joy. The world can try to fill that void in your heart, but it'll be unable to. And it will delight in trying to throw you all the pain and suffering that will come with it. But I will fill that void. And there'll be no side effects except for peace of mind and fulfillment. Lord, you're asking us to put both hands upon the plow. You're asking us to put both hands upon your, your pierced hands as you say, follow me. May you lead us. 
May we not look back. May you lead us and may we trust you. Even though it might seem what is a dead end in front of us, you have alternate plans. Even though we don't understand your will, it is for our betterment. Even though we are unsure, Lord, you are absolutely sure. So guide us today, Lord. Allow us to surrender our will, our direction, and our future into your capable hands. We ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, may his children say, Amen, Amen, and Amen.